where did it all begin for you? What kind of inspired the creation of uh, Sala? Um, well, Sala actually began in the middle of um, actually touring with my previous album, Luz, uh, under the banner name of Leaf. I was already very much deep into Nordic mythology and also Nordic literature to look at history and reenactment of certain time periods and getting to know even more of these Scandinavian historical instruments. Even though I had already for quite some years worked on uh, instruments like Nikkelharpa and, you know, ethnic overtones which from that region and stuff, uh, I just dove in deeper. So it was actually already 10 years ago where I really started to think I really want to like track down these ancient texts and learn from them and uh, see what I can use also in art. And so with Blot Billia, you could say that was kind of released as a single. Uh, I already started to showcase that I was going with my music a little bit into a darker ambient region of source and really calling on to these old um, gods and goddesses and uh, other mythological creatures that we see in the Nordic Eddas. And so it it really felt like I wanted to dive really deep into the subject matter and also grow as a person from that and, and find sort of the hidden, the hidden layers that are in these texts and unravel them. Um, and so that that began uh, with Blot Bilia and then going into Unner, uh, which was the Icelandic poem, um, sort of rewritten in, in a modern style, like by a modern feather, but but still like really implementing the, uh, the core tradition of Scaldic literature as we see in the past. So sort of challenging and testing myself and growing also along the way of making these first um, releases in this direction, growing also the necessary network that I needed to really bring the vision behind Saula to life. Because it's it's not, it is a solo album, but it's definitely a project where we had incredible guests coming along because I really wanted to capture the essence, you could say, of these Northern travels. And so, yeah, and from there, then, of course, the whole album was released with these nine daughters of the Ocean Goddess Ram as a thematic hand, hanger of sorts, like a, the handle to sort of get deep into the subject matter of the Nordic uh, mythology. Can you tell a bit more about the process of how you kind of integrated these uh, mythological themes into your music? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting for me because every song that I do sort of starts to not only be like a an, an art project for a song, but I, I I attach it to a team that is part of life. And so I try to approach the song as also personal catharsis for a subject. Like I really want to have a grasp of it or a, a personal experience with it before I want to record the subject matter. So having to get to know these nine daughters of Raun, you could say, where I had find out pretty early on that there was not a lot of uh, really uh, on-point meaning directed to them. It was more like um, one of those more obscure gods of the Nordic myths. Uh, I had the creative freedom to do it myself, which means I tied those daughters in with uh, weather conditions, different states of minds, different emotions that we all have in our sort of inner landscape. So ranging from calm and beautiful weather with like a glistering sun on the sea to raging ocean and like the devourer of ships. And so then I saw the picture for this album. Like I wanted to go through the whole cycle of these emotions and embody them and dive deep in them. So I spoke with Nordic literature people. I, I read up on a lot of sources, but I also, from a very practical point of view, I wanted to tie it in with personal experience, whether they were my own or those of a close one, uh, close ones like that are, that are really like close to me. Um, everywhere in life, you could say, uh, on my own journeys, I, I sort of started to tie 
certain themes in together to, to bring the picture per song. So if we look at, for example, uh, Stone Pillars, it's a lot about speaking justice and, and uh, the topic of betrayal, whether that is in a friendship, in a romantic relationship, or in even a work relationship can be anywhere. We all sometimes have sensed perhaps uh, a personal betrayal and how to deal with that from the viewpoint of the Nordic sagas, like how would they deal with it? You know, would they just chop off your head? Or, you know, go to a thing and debate, you know, on which piece of land belonged to which farmer. But so, yeah, I just started to tie those things in. And that made it also a very personal album. So part, part historical, part mythological, part personal. And yeah, it's it's a lot, actually. That's why I give pretty long answers. So, but yeah, that's also a little why it took so long to make, to write the songs. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about working very with very different artists like Jani Peuhu and Gaal and then uh, Umbra Ensemble? Yes, and we also see that we travel through the whole northern hemisphere of sorts. Of uh, so we 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 are when I worked, for example, with Umbra, which is like a female ensemble from Iceland. Uh, they are also group singers, uh, and I I really wanted to tie their voices in with the Icelandic pieces or pieces that were making very clear and direct references to historical uh, things from Iceland in particular. I, for me, like inviting people from Iceland onto the record was to, to bridge and sort of make that energetic connection as well to the content material. Because me as, an, as a foreigner, even though I've, you know, traveled and lived and been in these countries so often now, uh, I'm still from the outside. And so for me, inviting these collaborations onto the album, practically it was to make, you know, grow choruses bigger, to have these beautiful choir elements. But from an energetic level, it was really also to make connection to the lands, whether that's an instrument or a voice or a musician like Borgar Magnusson, who who really is like part of that sort of cult uh, niche Icelandic music scene, you know, worked with the best Sigur Rós and Björn. For me, that's like touching Iceland in itself. And working with uh, Gal, that actually has been from the start uh, part of this project and with this vision of bringing sort of these other forces in the Nordic cosmos to life through music. And of course, I, I met him already through working with Vartruna. And then when I did some guest performances with them, of course, the, the personal context also has grown and deepened. And so I knew, and, and him similarly, we were going to do much more together with singing. We just didn't know how or in which project. And it turned out to be actually on my own record. And so having him uh, and his energy again on board of this record, really, it, it, it's a very vital element for me to have that sort of deeper uh, masculine representation of voice, but also of mythology. And working with Gal is such a blessing because he can step into very different characters and sort of really embody or channel those, like whether that is... Gal the, the, could be like a screamer devouring kind of uh, Tours giant, or whether that is a very soft and high-pitched uh, kind of almost fragile voice on the brink of madness, perfectly fitting like one of my choruses where in Stone Pillars, the Justice song, it is also about the question of am I going mad or not, like a very kind of dangerous position in in your mental health state, like where you start to question yourself. So having Gal as a collaborator there, he's so um, open to just fully give himself to these characters and and these embodiments. So also energetically, I feel that was really complementing the album and, and really sort of balances us out when we sing in a song together. And then Yanni Peu, uh, I actually already like knew him personally. Uh, so we had a really close 
personal bond and from there I worked on his ENI project a little and from there we grew into having him also as my producer for this record and being you know one and a half years on sort of the daily office together like really checking in calling three times a day about like okay where are we now in the track what are we going to do next it just created this very practical flow of being really attuned to what we were working with to create Saula. And, you know, uh, yeah, Jani, of course, he is from Finland. He's he's a well-known songwriter, their producer, but also as a vocalist, very well-known. And so his voice actually was very beautiful and complementary to some pieces. And what is a really nice story about the duet track on this album, Saula, it's the only duet like where you have this classical setup of male and female singing a, a ballad of sorts, and they're each in their own world, contemplating on the same issue. Uh, the moment where you know a relation is, uh, yeah, it's meant to end, uh, or it's already over, but you have to come to acceptance. And so with him working with Janu, it was so beautiful because he recorded demo vocals and we were looking for a beautiful male guest singer. And no matter with whom we talk to, we talk to actually really beautiful and good vocalists. We still felt always called back to go to the original demo vocal because Yanni had actually done such a good job. And the moment where we had recorded, we also had had sort of an emotional day. So it was really filled with the, with the good original emotion. So there was no need to change it. And so Yanni is also very much part of this album as a producer, but also as, a, as one of the, the guest artists together with Gal, Mitch Harris, like the, the male vocal choir as well. Mm. And then unfortunately, there's also a lot more other <laughs> guests to mention, but that would really lengthen the interview. But uh, to summarize those beautiful people in short, there were, even though I play a lot of instruments myself, historic instruments, there were a few that I didn't. And so, of course, when you do a whole album production in, in also in Finland, you need to have a Yohiko a player. Yeah, you need to have that sound, especially when you work with these old primal pre-Christian uh, mythologies and and uh, this kind of soundscape of Nordic dark folk. So we, we worked with a few experts on, on respectively their own instruments and historic instruments. Uh, if we take another song, uh, mm. the Kolga, it addresses uh, female persecution. How did you approach writing this song? Well, Kolga actually had, uh, it's it's funny you lift that one out for the writing because it's sort of the unicorn in the album where the writing process actually hadn't started with me. Uh, it started with uh, me and Jan Peo working on album two for another project, e and uh, which is also a very beautiful project. But um, uh, we... we he wrote like a, a draft for a song on this new album, and I recorded some heavy strings on that, on the Manikalarpa. And the texture was so beautiful and heavy and melancholic um, that already it I felt really kind of personally attached to that song for E and I, of which I was back then also uh, writing for or helping out recording with. And... Uh, I just felt like very personal attached to it, even though it, it really stemmed like the original composition and, and arrangement stemmed from Yanni Peu's feather. Um, but it, it was one of those songs that really resonated deep within me. And while we were working on Saula, it sort of became clear that uh, the original draft 16 for e and I was really, would really fit very well to the album of Saula. And being in that, sort of duo uh, craftsman, artist, producer work, you know, like it was like we were just sharing everything. Like we were, so we weren't like precious about the songs either. It was like, okay, this song actually fits more to this album. And so Kolga, then of course I had so much lyrical material already for songs and, and other demos that I've made and, and songs we were working on. It was kind of, easy to get that heavy feeling of those really deep Nick Harper strings and that 
kind of like oh death like death sleep feeling into the lyrics and and material I already had gathered and written like as my own lyrical poetry so I could just lay on my my words very instinctively and um with the chorus there uh I actually tied it into different mythological female characters and uh for the for the history uh reader they will understand that these female names they come from very different stories from different uh time periods uh but they are all part of the body of nordic literature and they will uh, be able to pick out like all all of these women actually in their story arc have made a personal sacrifice and so that was a little bit of an homage to these uh people like almost as if they had you know been living people for real but i think these uh characters they are more like a representation of course or like uh you know in the stories we give them a, a certain name but in the past we also do have seen that it was very difficult for the feminine role in nordic society to adjust when christianity came and uh you know going from a position where uh for example a seer or a priestess was welcomed into a household to predict uh weather conditions for the next uh, you know crop for the farmland it became a persecuted uh a position and something forbidden so this we can know and read up not only from our uh, historical mythological stories but also actually going deep into historical law making and if you go into old historic political documents you can actually see the change in society where at some points certain items or very feminine profession role objects were forbidden to keep in your household, uh, you know, this could cost you your life. So we, we see that change of being like, uh, and this is something I, I put light on onto my album of the feminine role in Northern society of ancient days, but, but it's also unfortunately still relevant today. I think we see still that um, in certain professions, like for example, the music industry, uh, women need to, work a little harder to be taken serious or have to protect themselves uh, so yeah <laughs> back to Kolga <laughs> I've drifted off there a little but back to Kolga it, it really is that embodiment of uh, the female struggle and at the same time the, the beauty of the sacrifices that they made to help the hero in the story in the end. we've been talking about the process uh, of this album but how how have your personal experiences uh, shaped the music, Gonzalo? Yeah, well, it's it's uh, as as I mentioned before, it's uh, there are personal experiences woven into these lyrics, and also personal experiences of people close to me, and so, for example, family or like really close friends or partners. Um, what 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 happens with me is when I start writing lyrics i don't always know in which project they're going to end up um but some of these lyrics they are um really stemming from personal emotional experience sort of, sort of like a diary entry or a travelogue of something that i experienced on my journey but i try to widen it up i try to make it more like a this is something everyone can encounter like on your own personal hero's journey we all, you know, face certain obstacles that we want to overcome and then grow as a person and sort of meet the next challenge. And so for me, that's how I try to approach these these situations, both in in an art form, but also in life, like going yourself through these almost cliche obstacles to reach your end goal, uh, sort of uh, being delayed by illness or being broken and still having to like carry out a certain uh situation or song or project you know just having these obstacles in life that sort of demand a little bit more strength from you to pursue and go on has worked its way into the lyrics and into the energy of the album where it it is about overcoming uh these personal 
uh, ideas and obstacles, you know, the maddening mind, that situation where you think, am I going crazy, was coming from COVID period, actually. So it, it can be relatable to uh, many people. Uh, it's just that I think a lot of artists actually do this. Uh, the, we might have a person in mind, you know, when we sing you or I think only of you or you've burned me to ashes or whatever it can be. It can be any dramatic lyric. Of course, we have our own personal references in the back of our minds. But for the for the listener, it will be their precious person. And so I hope to make it relatable to anyone who is going through obstacles and, and depression or illness or heartbreak really things that can drag us down and and know that you can sort of reach shore. You can reach uh, another point of view again and and still realize you have grown as a person and something, something very beautiful came out of it. So I hope at least, like, especially if I'm like an old little granny on my porch later, you know, when I'm old and gray and I'm going to look back on my life, that I'm going to say, Ah, this was beautiful because there I made like a life experience into art. And that way it's sort of a little preserved and can be carried on to my daughter and to maybe her, you know, children later in life or however that goes. But but yeah, that's my way of of creating art. We make the best art when we feel a little down. Unfortunately, people like me, sensitive artists, uh, and it's in it's yeah it it is sad and almost almost like funny of sorts but the best songs are written when we feel the worst it's almost like yeah <laughs> unfortunately like an anchor point we need just to get it out and uh, yeah that's that's how uh, how i did it and then having this whole nordic cosmos tied into it of course makes it very very focused on the lesson that we can learn from Nordic tradition, from ancient culture. So you could say that has been that has been sort of my guide. Like how how would a hero in Nordic story deal with this matter? And how can I apply that to my own life? So yeah, that's been my theme for the last nine years. <laughs> so Hmm. As a project that was uh, recorded in uh, various locations and sung in uh, different languages, what was the most challenging aspect of creating this album? Hmm. I think for me to have everything fall in the right place, um, practically, you know, having uh, the right label uh, just to release this, because I, I really wanted to do this in a in a proper way and and sometimes you know it's beautiful to be an independent artist but i did want to make that next step like my listeners have been asking for vinyl and you know this kind of product production of uh, a bigger level uh, of sorts uh for so many years like i've been of course super blessed to have had really strong following for so long I think it's because I've been doing this for so long, like from the start, together with a few other like uh, people who are now like giants in the scene of Nordic folk. Uh, so I, I, I've been blessed with that, but I also felt a little bit the, the need to want to perfectionize it and bring this Saula album out with the right people, uh, the right label partner, and people who wanted to share in the vision of you know, doing, not cutting corners, like not, <laughs> I made in another interview a comparison, like this is not, it, unfortunately, this is not a hot dog stand. This is not a music project that will release music every three months, you know, from a sample bank based uh, situation. This is a true passion project. So we're, we're taking the travel to Iceland. We're going to record on the countryside with a stonemason marimba maker, you know, we're going to put in the crazy effort or, or go to Norway to, to be with Gal and make, make magical recordings with him. And so I needed a trusted partner for that who uh, really understand the vision that I had for Saula and was, uh, was willing to take me on, uh, on, on my word for that. 
And so um, having found in Finland, actually, Svart Records was really beautiful because Svart, it, it is known for being also a little bit perfectionistic, like having these crazy beautiful vinyl products and really beautiful artist roster. And so they, they, are, they, were, they were great and they came in in the right time. And so I, I think it's, it's not such so much so a poetic answer that I'm giving, but it is a practical answer that I think also a lot of artists can relate to if they listen to, to you know, this interview, because I think it's something we, we can shed light on, that it's not always just a matter of if the artist feels like it, we, we still need to work with other people. And that also means those, those kind of situations really need to be put in place and, uh, and done well before we can actually bring it out and uh, or finalize recording, and uh, and that's that's also just a practical uh, financial investment. Like before, I always did my releases on my own and crowdfunded those with again my beautiful following, and that of course was such a beautiful community effort. Like being able to to do the loose album uh, back then with Christopher Yule from Heiden in Marvel Studios in Denmark. That was something I really needed to have my following for and to help do a GoFundMe. And uh, and and it worked out, but uh, for this one, it was time to be with a professional label. 